Hey all, welcome to Circle of Tone. Today we have Goth Roth with Bauhaus. So I got the information from Daniel Ash that he used a DS1 pedal on it. That pedal was used on that era of Bauhaus, but I didn't hear it on the single. So I'm like, huh, how come did he tell me it was a HH combo? It was a DS1 pedal and a 1972 Telecaster on that track. I'm like, because I got the information from him himself. And that's from the live version of it. The live version sounds nothing like the X-Ray Eyes version of the single. Absolutely night and day, completely different songs, right? <laughs> And then I kept on reading about Daniel Ash and how he would specifically go out of his way if he heard something which sounded like the guitar at the time, say U2 or something, he would go, I can't, it has to sound like us and not like anybody else. They were massively influenced by uh, Ziggy era Bowie, right? So he didn't want to necessarily sound like his heroes. He wanted to sound like himself. So I was thinking there's the live version and there's the single version. A lot of people don't know which one is best. So I went in the middle. What would I do if I was in Bauhaus, basically? So I could hear the danceable rhythms, right, from the early stuff, including Beryl Lugosi's Dead. But there was a lot of dub, a lot of reggae influence with the actual rhythmic section when it comes to uh, Bauhaus because David J is very influenced by that type of thing. So I thought the lyrics for X-Ray Man are so heavy. Oh, you want to talk about gothic imagery? The lyrics are fucking crazy. Under the dreadful birds. Under the singing soil. I've seen too much. Wipe away my eyes. Bitch. I'm throwing my panties at the band. They're, they're all fucking... You have this gothic dark band. Before that, remember, before that, you used to have colours everywhere because you had the glam rock movement. You know, there is the Iggy, the um, T-Rex. So everything was so colourful. The name Bauhaus itself is from grim German art and industry combined because Bauhaus movement, I think it means house building. Basically, what the Bauhaus movement was, I think, industrial art. So something that can be reproduced, reproduced, reproduced. Minimalist design, no frills, but still has a little bit of the edges, the curves. They are the art rather than, you know, you got to step back and look at the whole thing, right? There's no detail. So they are stripped down the x-ray eyes is a stripped down song which is kind of the way i picked that one people may be wondering why did i pick that song it's the fucking lyrics the stark though I, but i being myself i had to put my own metal influence with me so i did make it a bit heavier so it's nothing like the original version i've made it my own i did hype up the bass i did hype up the drums to be a more of a disco pump all right so i, I thought that type of lyrics a driving, you know, German. That's how I'm explaining my version of the song. It sounds nothing like it, but I do still think that it has that edge to it, a little bit of edge, even though mine is a little bit of Bauhaus on ice. I still like it. <laughs> so, so that's it, because when he said there's a DS1 pedal on this song, I could not hear it through the whole thing, and I think he might be getting, because it's been so long, I think he might be getting mixed up with the live version with that. I don't want to concentrate on gear as much as I want to concentrate about the zeitgeist that causes movements. Let's talk about Beryl Lugosi's Dead. A. It was the first thing that they'd ever recorded. B. It was nine minutes long. C. The lyrics came to David J. in a dream. D. The whole thing came from a phone conversation that... Uh, David J and Daniel Ash had, where Daniel was saying, I got this riff, where it's a really creepy, creeping riff that gets under your skin. And David J was like, I just had a nightmare. And in that dream, these lyrics, I can't get them out of my head. So I'm going to write them down and we're going to pen this song. So the concept is weird. A dream and it just happenstance happens where he's got a creepy riff and they're talking about it. And see, if you have somebody else in your band, if you're 
a modern musician, you're probably just writing shit on your own to a DAW, to a click track. You're not going to get any of these interactions that create this. You know, another interaction was they knew that the singer was a cool guy in school and he, did, he wasn't actually a singer, but they got him in because he had the look and his voice. Oh my God, how, how, what are the odds of that? His voice would that had that much character, you know? So anyway, the, the concept was just a phone call, right? People interacting. Remember that, kids, before the internet, where you interact with other people in a room? E, they messed with the drums. So the drums had a delay. A delay pedal is something that, so if you do one, they'll go one, 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 two, 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 two. So they put a delay pedal and manipulated it manually while they, that this is never done live, right? So they had somebody, probably the singer, manipulating the, uh, the, the tape uh, on the drum bus, all right? Could be done afterwards, but, uh, you know, recording was kind of limited back then. First fucking take, they create goth rock with all these little things falling into place. I mean, how good is that song, man? And it, thankfully, one record executive had faith in them and wanted to release the whole thing untouched. Obviously, people were interested in it because it was so good, but they wanted to chop it down into singles. But they said, no, it has to go out full. I think what got them pressed was because the Velvet Underground had done something similar on a, a very long song. F. They had to beg the people recording them to, to hit record. They, they, because obviously you, you're when you're warming up and you, you, you're running through, you're getting your levels and they're playing this song, um, they said, okay, we're going to hit record now. And the guys, the producers were like, you serious? This, you're just wasting tape. And they went, no, hit record and we'll go for it. And that became a single, which lasted in the charts. Uh, obviously not, not, not top 10 or anything, but it was hovering around the charts for years because of people like John Peel, uh, seminal BBC One, producer and uh, disc jockey. I forgot what they're called. It's such an old concept now being a DJ. I forgot what a DJ was called. <laughs> but he had probably the best record collection in the world. Uh, he started genres. I don't care what you say. Uh, goth rock would not be here if it wasn't for John Peel. He would not. Uh, gr grindcore wouldn't be here if it wasn't for John Peel. He was the one that pushed Napalm Death in people's faces, who pushed Bolt Throw in people's faces. All right? So... Hats off, respect. I actually learned how to record with a book. Remember those books? They had spines and pages. Because he was so into the DIY aspect, he wrote a book on how to record back in the day when you only had four tracks, you know, available to you. So I learned how to record by John Peel. The impact that man had on British alternative music is uh, he's probably the most important figure in the history of independent music. John Peel. Go look him up. Awesome guy, rest in peace. So John Peel would be playing their music nonstop, you know, and uh, the first time they played them, they're actually Mothead come into this. They had the single with them the first time they ever got radio play. They went to the BBC and, they, you know, they got people on the gate and everything and Mothead were coming out. And he said, are we friends of Mothead and we friends of uh, John Peel? And he said that you have to play this tonight. So they kind of blagged their way onto the radio and John Peel played it. And the phone call started coming in. Please play it again. Please play it again. It's a DJ's dream because it's like 10 minutes long. So it's like you can put your feet up, go for a shit and all that good stuff, you know. But that is the type of thing I'm talking about, which does not happen today because you're all in front of a DAW, in front of Pro Tools with your drums snapped to a click. You know, there's no interaction which become these amazing gestalt entities. It's not... Oh, he used a Boss DS1 distortion pedal with a 1972 Fender Telecaster and a HH combo. HH combos sound like ass, in my opinion, all right? That actually helped the stripped-down aspect of how rinky-dink the guitars kind of sound. But when you got David J's bass, I think it's a fretless uh, P bass, and the just the vibe of that song just launched them into the underground. They never got big. I mean, Love and Rockets, uh, which was a side band of David J and Daniel Ash, that got bigger than Bauhaus, believe it or not. So Bauhaus have always just creeped along, creeped along in the shadows. And I respect that. Being part of that culture, because there was an underground culture where you could have gone up to a normie in Piccadilly Circus and said, hey, what do you think of this Bela Lugosi's Dracula movie? What do you think of that? And they wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. 
they go to bed at 8 p.m. These are good people. They weren't watching Hammer House of Horror at 10 p.m., you know, on BBC Two back in the day. Hammer House of Horror, classic uh, werewolf, Frankenstein, you know, all stuff like that. I've, I've, I've mentioned it in the past of how influential, influential Hammer Horror has been on music in the UK. So there was this big subculture of people that were obsessed with the dark, with the occult, with creepiness. But then you have this eclectic bass player that was into re really underground dub reggae roots stuff. You don't have these black metal clones, these, you know, doom metal barista looking clones going around just copying pedals because, you know, Sleep used it in the past or whatever. You don't have these clones. They went out of their way to sound different. And they were part of the movement. They would they were looking at the cool, crazy things like different art movements in Germany that, you know, typical art student uh, behavior. But I'm so glad that that label believed in them to release that song. So it's not just gear. It's not just gear. It's all about being in a band, bouncing ideas off people, obviously jamming and all the rest of it, and just being creative. Nobody's being creative these days. They just copy and paste in somebody else's anguish. Screamed, anguish screams in black metal are like nails on a chalkboard to me now because all they're doing is copying old Hellhammer from back in the day. And what influenced them? The big moment in the UK, which practically started a huge movement into different aspects of guitar music, was... Starman by David Bowie in the Ziggy era. So on Top of the Pops, there was this era where they kissed on stage, you know? Well, no, he had his arm around him, didn't even kiss, where it looked slightly homoerotic and you couldn't tell if they were boys or girls. You know, it was such a big deal back in the day. So young Daniel Ash was watching that, eating his fucking cornflakes with his mouth wide open. And half of the country did that at the same time. And that's part of the reason why rock and metal is dead now. Normies, nothing's going to come into their regular feed. It's going to be Bad Bunny. It's going to be Post Malone. It's going to be, you know, Olivia Rodriguez. That's what's coming into Normies' feeds. There's no David Bowie's with their fucking tight, shiny clothes, you know, with his foot up on the monitor, just blowing minds. So it's that influence that started Bauhaus, you know, as they were. But now you don't have people being inspired by the Lemmys, being inspired by the Ziggies being inspired by the Beatles to pick up a guitar or bass, you know? So it's like, that's part of the reason why rock and metal is dying. Speaking of Lemmy, he's, he, a famous uh, Lemmy interview, he said that the first bands that you latch onto never leave you when you're a kid. And he said, Daniel Ash said, that was such an insightful thing because Bowie and Ziggy never, they, they, did, they ended up doing cover versions and things like that, which actually would become a big hit for them, relatively, you know. So, and it's the same with me, like, uh, people who like this band probably like Adam and the Ants. You can check out my video I did on Adam and the Ants with uh, Marco Peroni, my biggest influence when I was a kid. And they, that type of stuff never leaves you. So I can't emphasize the influence of different musicians on you, if you, because mostly guitarists watch my channel. Somebody else, who in school, like, they plucked their singer from school because they knew he was cool, right? Who do you know in your sphere of influence, your sphere of friends, that would make a great frontman? You know, nothing but cheekbones and abs and just, just has swagger. Because you can cheat. Everybody cheated in the studios back in the day. It just so happens that his voice did have that thing. But with goth rock, the first bite is almost always with the eye. You know, the bats on the single and the gothic imagery. So you, it's hard to be, you know, a gothic act and look like the average guy on the street. That would be kind of subversive. I kind of like that idea, but, you know, because is there anybody, the average person, is there anything more interesting to me than the deep down, the dark angst and worries and of NPCs? You know, because a lot of people do a very good job of uh, masking what they have inside. I'm sure there's a lot of men in New Balance just going to soccer practice that have some fucking demons that they would like to get out, you know? Just think about, forget tone, forget guitar sounds, forget what is the best snare to use on Easy Drummer. Think about what you have deep in here that you would like to express, all right? 
What is influencing you? What can you bring to the table that maybe somebody else hasn't uh, hasn't heard? Every, do you know what everybody has, has, has brought to the table? An SM57 microphone, a Vintage 30 speaker through with a, with a TS9 tube screamer with some sort of amp that's being pushed, all right? That's not you. That's forum speak, okay? You're being, everybody's becoming clones of each other regardless of what genre you're in. You know, if you're into Doom, you've heard of Matt Amp, you've heard of Green Amps, you've heard of uh, Sun Amplifiers. You're all fucking copying each other like a bunch of clones, you know, down to the ripped jeans and the fucking manicured beard. I better watch out. I did actually manicure my beard today. Because Starman felt dangerous. Just putting his armor on the guitarist, that back then was dangerous. The first time that David Bowie was on camera was for a BBC thing about long hair. It's all got to stop. They've had enough. The worms are turning. The rebellion of the long hairs is getting underway. They're tired of persecution, they're tired of taunts, they're tired of losing their jobs, they're tired of being sent home from college, they're tired of being sent home from school, they're tired even of being refused the dole. So with the nucleus of uh, some of his friends, a 17-year-old Davy Jones has just founded the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Long-Haired Men. Well, here we are. Long-haired men, you've got to have your hair, what, nine inches long before you can join? Well, I think we're past that over now. Have you? Yes. Now, exactly who's being cruel to you? Well, I think we're all fairly tolerant, but for the last two years we've had uh, comments like, darling, and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us? And I think it's just had to stop now. But, but does this surprise you that you get this kind of comment? Because, you're, after all, you haven't got really rather long hair, haven't you? We have, yes. Yeah, it's not too bad, really. No, I like it, and I think we all like long hair. And um, we don't see why should other people should persecute us because of this. Now, his hair was probably as long as mine, all right? Mine's slicked back, but because um, I'm a cool guy. But having long hair in that era would get you beaten up in the streets. Being androgynous back then was dangerous. Would get the shit kicked out of you. I mean... Um, is he play guitar? The lyrics of that is, you know, shall we smash his hands? Because he looks different to us, so he can't play guitar. You can't get more punk, you can't get more metal than David Bowie. He, at the peak of their fame, quit the band. And the band didn't even know. He said, oh, this is the last time you're ever going to see um, the Spiders from Mars. The band were like looking at each other like, what the fuck? That's fucking punk, man. That is rock and roll. So a lot of metal punk rock is being cut and paste and it's inauthentic so that's what i like about bauhaus so they could have sold out they went out their way they, it, how can you sell out when you start off with a nine minute single <laughs> yeah so because you've got to be authentic i mean daniel ash he uh you know wears leather and things like that but he wore a leather jacket because he actually was a biker you know he lived and breathed the scene. He wasn't just a poser that like putting on a, a biker jacket because you know that's what everybody does back in the day. There was I, I bet, by the way I fell in love with Daniel Ash doing this. He is the he is so funny. A fan brought his old leather jacket which got stolen and give it to him on camera and it is the coolest fucking thing because it spoke to me. I had a leather jacket right with my band was called purple brain fever at the time it's like a punk thrash type of band and it had the coolest art you've ever seen on the back the guitarist jay was a fantastic artist and he um did, did this big mural on the back with purple brain fever and that thing was so comfortable so beat up and it was like a cloak of superiority when i was when i was watching it and speaking of the band the band that was my old band but i was in a new band called season's end and I was watching my singer be in a fight with another guy, a bigger guy. So I was there just in case, you know, the people jump in on fights. So they fought to, uh, they both fought like tough bastards to a no score draw. They both pretty much drew. 
And I, but I put my jacket down because I know, you know, people grab your collar and shit. So I just have my T-shirt on. It's fucking freezing. So I put my jacket down on the side and uh, they had a fight and shook hands afterwards. It was all good. And I woke off and my jacket's gone. I probably think about that jacket once a month. We have a special presentation tonight, yes. old son. Yeah, it's a box of chocolates, right? Oh, yes. Box of chocolates. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, it isn't that jacket I lost, is it? <laughs> very, very difficult. I smelt it straight away. It's that smelly stench. This thing is great. It's got this really old leather. <laughs> 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 That's amazing. I was backstage with the girl who took it. And I said, we have to get it. Thank you so much. Sure. So there you go, I got the jacket back, see? And he he got his jacket and he's like, you can smell you could smell it before you even saw it because things like that are so familiar. And it's little things, the the interlocking parts of scenes, you know. Scenes and actually I just found that band, Seasons End. I just found my old demo from them. So thrash, you know, where I could barely play, but I was really trying to be as technical as I could. And it's actually good. Would you guys be interested in that? Listening to nineteen uh eighty eight thrash would you be interested in me doing uh, a video on my old band season's end and the hijinks we came out to that was just one part where they were in a fight i've been in we've had uh, the pa catch fire when we were playing we've had uh my aunties getting crushed in marsh pits because they didn't know what was going on so i'm going to see my my nephew's band <laughs> and that's another thing I, I mentioned in the past on my sex uh, pistols video if you check out my video i did on the sex pistols um, Spedden, Chris Spedden brought out the song Motorbiking and that influenced Daniel Ash too. And with David J, that bass playing on X-Ray Eyes and stuff like that, it's, I, I, I played a pick because I couldn't play it with as much attack, but I think he plays, plays it with his fingers. But underrated bass playing when it comes to being the pulse underneath these kick-ass drums. I mean, the drums were, a lot of it were just rolls. You know, speaking of the you know, there was a, the, the, was it the Burundi beats, whatever was big back then with Adam and the Ants, things like that. So a lot of uh, drummers started going heavy on the, uh, the bass drum. So with X-Ray Eyes, there's quite a lot of that on that song. But I put a snare in there because I thought I wanted to get the danceable aspect because Gothic rock is hugely underrated when it comes to being danceable. It's very, it gets you going. I wanted mine, my version to be danceable which is what it is, because it kind of like with a hi-hat and everything, I, I try to create something which is heavy sounding because the lyrics are crazy under the dreadful birds. I mean, they're one of my favorite lyrics. These lyrics, man, this band, just so creative. I just wish it's hard. It is harder to be original these days. My channel, I have to drag myself sometimes to think about what I'm going to do because there is nothing going on in rock and metal. You know, nothing original. So if you guys have any suggestions of what bands you would like to see on Goth Broth, I'm thinking also uh, of doing a, a series in October called Chugtober, where I go into my favorite thrash era chugs for the whole month. So I think that would be fun. Some shorter videos, but I start to go into the intricacies of what makes chug chug. So if you're wondering what's going on with my channel, why I didn't upload recently, let me just give you an example of what happened this week. I'm looking for a house to put a studio in, okay? I just drove 16 hours, okay, to see a house to buy to put my studio in. I get there, there's nobody there. The, uh, I get a text then from the real estate agent saying, okay, I'm on my way. She didn't turn up, I waited for two and a half hours. The back door was open, they give me the code for the front, but the back door was wide open anyway. I go to this house, beautiful old house, and go upstairs. There's only two bedrooms in this entire house. There's two, there's four rooms total that are livable in this big old house. They said it was a three bedroom. They lied. Why did I drive for eight hours? It's because you got to jump on things really quick now when they come on the market. You got to be first because there's going to be a bunch of people doing it. So I got to be there fast. But little did I think is that they would say that a three-bedroom house is actually, in reality, a two-bedroom. And they're not cheating, by the way. You know, you can say, oh, there's an extra room. If it has a closet, you can call it a bedroom. If one room has a closet, you can call it a bedroom. 
the two rooms downstairs, none of them had closets. So I got fucked by my real estate agent. And I'm still fucking angry and it's crazy. So yeah, that's what, uh, at the moment, I'm not working on the channel as much because I'm trying to get settled because I'm still renting at the moment and I can't do it properly here because the neighbors, you know, I like to crank my amps. So we are working, if we're working on one thing, which if it works out, will be the coolest studio of all time. So thanks to my patrons of Tone. It's not many sign ups, sign ups recently, but uh, Ryan Ash, thanks for signing up. If you like these types of uh, videos, if you want to learn about gothic rock, metal, thrash, even I've done pop in the past with like moody blues and stuff like that, which is kind of gothy in my opinion, check the description and you could become a patron of Tone like shout you out on the channel, all that good stuff. And thanks to the old patrons. Some of them have been there for years. You guys are awesome and keep these speakers flapping. So what gear did I use? Uh, funnily enough, I used the same stuff I just used on fellow goth uh, luminary Peter Steele on the bass. So I used Boss pedals. I used the Boss, the DS1, obviously, but I had Boss Delay and a Boss Chorus. He also used, back in the day, Daniel Ash used an old Carlsboro flanger that I'd love to get my hands on. If you guys in Britain, if you see an old, big, shiny, metallic blue flanger by Carlsboro, pick that thing up. And so I use this with an old Fane Pop 50 speaker because, you know, I do have to be a little bit of a uh, coke sniffer when it comes to my gear. And I use the precursor to the SM57, which is an old uh, Unidyne microphone. So I also, on the guitars, on the heavy guitars, I recorded through this as well so that you could get a little bit of the room and it created the feedback um, pretty nicely. It's, a, it's an underlying feedback that I had in the song. So give it another listen. Give my song another listen now that you know my reasoning behind it. And uh, it's kind of, um, it's kind of Moorish. I keep on trying to go and listen to it. I'm saying, this is all right. My vocals are a bit low. I didn't really mix it. I just did a rough and ready thing because, you know, they were one take wonders and I didn't want to overthink it. I just played with passion and uh, a bit of fucking vim, a bit of, and vinegar <laughs> so thanks guys thanks again to my patrons you guys are awesome if you have any gothic bands if you know uh fields of the nephilim if you know uh christian death if you know any of the gear they used please please comment um if you have any requests of any old fa famous gothic acts uh let me know and uh i'll give them a listen because uh that's what this circular tone it's called circle of tone because of the how we interact. I, I was doing live uh, videos for a while. I'll start doing them up again, but uh, I've been really, really busy recently and uh, I can't wait to get settled, put it that way, because then we can do this daily and get a little bit of a schedule, you know? If you're new here, I've already done The Damned, I've done The Cure, I've done Susie and the Banshees, I've done Adam and the Ants Knockoff, but I've done Typo Negative. I've done Paradise Lost. I've done Killing Joke. I've done quite a, quite a lot of gloomy, miserable bands. I've done, you know, Celtic Frost, the kind of, they get gothic, especially to Into the Pandemonium. That's a pretty gothy sounding album. So yeah, these influences are great. I am surprised that gothic metal isn't big right now because I mentioned the beats. Uh, so a lot of gothic bands like Type of Negative were drum machines and you'd think that everything snapped to a grid over this era. You would think that industrial metal, oh, I've done Nine Inch Nails, by the way. <laughs> you'd think that it would be bigger now because of the DAW, because a lot of that was, like a lot of Nine Inch Nails was snapped to a grid. So, you know, I, I've mentioned ad nauseum about the death of rock and metal comes hand in hand with snapping stuff to a grid, with fake drums, but that's more of the rock the spit and sawdust aspect of it. But a lot of gothic music was pretty danceable, pretty snap to a grid, pretty, you know, evil disco. And I've done Danzig. <laughs> I'm just trying to advertise my channel because it's like the channel's dying. People are unsubscribing because I dare say rock and metal is dying versus what it was in the past. Oh, no. And uh, people don't want to hear that. All right, chaps. Have a good one. You've been great. More coming soon. Chugtober is just around the corner. Let me know what Chuggy Chug bands that you want to hear. And that's it. Circle of Tone.